Hey everybody, PDA Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show, bringing you in, I think, a really interesting chat today. So way back when, I had a show called Popping the Bubble that I did with my friend Sandra Ponce de Leon. And Sandra and I, we would examine things in the world of IT, technology, that sort of thing. And Sandra, is that's her home, that's her professional home, is, is that part of the world. So as we examine these things, we would put the shows out, and it just got to be a lot with the two different shows, so we sort of shuttered that show, and now, every now and then, we put together another one of these things. This is one of those episodes, so it's sort of popping the bubble-esque, but I think you'll find this interesting. We we don't really even really talk about technology. It's more about the theory behind technology and solving problems with a guy named Brian Dolan, who runs Verdant AI. And so he is a, a mathematician. And I, when I say that, a mathematician, I mean like a master mathematician. This guy really gets it. And he solves problems with math and with programming and with AI. And so we start to dive into some, some pretty complex social things, you know, because we expect computers to solve all of our problems. But in reality, it gets tough. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Again, look up Verdant AI to learn more about Brian. Of course, you can always look up Sandra and what she's doing on LinkedIn or social media or whatever. She's very accessible and is always working on things. A lot of our guests that have a blue focus are are provided in part either secondarily from an original Sandra contact or from Sandra herself. We're really both passionate about the ocean. Okay, one more thing to tell you. We've completed all of the work on Save the Braves, Ride for the Brave. We've done the uh, closeout show. You can get that stuff on BreakItDownShow.com. You can see that where Scott and I sit down and go through everything. The only thing left is the raffle for the weapon itself, and the details in that are about to come out, so stand by. But I think what we're going to do is our sell a limited number of tickets to get this rifle, and that'll raise money for that. Okay, uh, back to Brian. I know you're going to love this episode. It's it's just such an interesting way to look at things and, and here again like always like brian probably leans a little more left than i do but we have this fantastic conversation that doesn't really worry about a party it worries about trying to solve big complex problems and using computers and and game theory to try to figure these things out i know you'll like it i think it's a, a great chat in the beginning of many more i think brian and i have figured out that we have a lot to talk about and so we're going to continue to do that hey enjoy this conversation here comes brian dolan Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Brian Dolan, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. What up, what up, what up, everybody? I'm so excited to have uh, Brian on. You know, along the way, you get to meet so many incredible people when you podcast. You all have heard me say this a thousand times, but it just continues to be true, Brian. And, and with your line of work, you must meet incredible people as well. You're an entrepreneur. You've been in the AI space for ages. And I should also, really what I should do is shut up and say, Sandra, thanks for coming on. I always love you co-host. <laughs> Tell us why we have Brian on today. Um, well, Brian is an amazing mathematician and cyberneticist, and he he breaks down data in a way that is um, uh, understandable. I kind of wish Brian had been my math teacher in high school because I'm actually learning a lot about math uh, today. That uh, just it just makes it you know real relevant and approachable. And um, what Brian does with all these amazing math skills is he builds really cool products. So. Um, looking forward to hearing the conversation and just being a fly on the wall. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Fantastic. Brian, what do you think of that intro? It's way too much. <laughs> I mean, you know how like every person who has reached a, a level of success in their life feels like an imposter. Maybe not everybody, but I think most decent people feel like an imposter. I feel yeah. like an imposter all the time. It's yeah. true. I've done fun stuff and I met some really cool people and I've been exposed to some really exciting experiences but you're always sort of like yeah but you know like they say the more you learn the less you know and i definitely feel that um but that assumes of course that i've learned anything yeah uh, yeah right which is exactly what you're supposed to say when you're when you realize you know a lot of things you realize you know nothing but yeah mm -hmm. that that is another benefit too of the show is to be able to share it with people like what you actually have done because it is hard for you to recognize your own success and we are a little unfair and hard on ourselves and whether mm -hmm. it's imposter syndrome or just not looking back and appreciating 
damn, you know, I have done all these things. And we didn't even talk about like your other hobbies and interests that are also mm-hmm. fascinating as well, too. Give us a more of a well-rounded approach, obviously businessman, AI, mathematician yeah. type person, but what else makes Brian, Brian? Uh, I'm a dad. I mean, that's huge, right? Just like you, you don't, uh, friends of mine who haven't had kids, it's hard to explain to them how, uh, incredibly important ch- you know, having a child is and how, like I would tell people, take your worst high school crush, double it, and that is every day with your kids. Like the amount of love you feel and infatuation uh-huh. you feel every day with your kids. And um, that is probably the most defining thing about me when I sit and I think about what I enjoy in life. It's definitely my, my wife and my kids. Um, and so that's one thing I think that is probably one of the more defining things. And one of the things I love about <laughs> I shouldn't say it this way, but one of the things I'm appreciating about COVID, one of the silver linings is seeing everybody and their families. Like I was on two calls yesterday where the kids came running through in the background. And I just love that. Like to me, that connection with people, that's what we are as a species. We're a social species. Um, so I definitely like that. Um, I also, you know, I'm a musician. I was a semi-professional musician for a while and I still play Irish music occasionally. You could pull out my Irish tenor banjo and go to the pub and drink some Guinness and play some tunes. Um, that's a really <laughs> important part of my life, just in identifying who I am to myself. Um, and I play ice hockey. Uh, two of the members of my team, actually, I met on my ice hockey team. Uh, I don't play it well. So when people say, oh, you must be good, I am not. I am very <laughs> not good. <laughs> How would you describe your game? Like, what, what value do you bring to the ice for your team? I comedic relief. Okay. <laughs> no the only thing i have going for me i'm slower you know i'm like not a really great player the only thing i feel like i have going and my team will support this is that i tend to get in the way really well sure so i play wing and when they're when we're in transition game in the, in the middle ice i can stop a lot of people that's really what i do well <laughs> so i can get there and get in the way a lot um, the gate probably, you... <laughs> yeah. what was that you're the gate you just Get in the I'm way. The you, like, exactly. Oh, I can let you buy now. Yes. Right. Right. They call it the left wing trap for a reason. You know, and I, I do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I'm also just sort of a generally curious person about um, all kinds of science, especially biological sciences and mathematical sciences. So, you know, if, if I were to go in order of things that are important to me, definitely, you know, family, um, mathematics is way up there. I just enjoy it. Um, science, ice hockey, Irish music, um, good beer, uh, and traveling, you know, the, and that sounds really boring, right? No, but you not think at all. About... <laughs> it sounds fun. Okay, it sounds like well, a great I mean, life. <laughs> well, I'm not like, you know, biohacking or something like that. And you think about like, that's what life is, right? That's what the, the, the good parts of life are is these moments you have, um, in game theory, they have this notion of, uh, games in the, in the large and games in the small. And everything is a game in the small. When you break it down, it's all a game in the small. It's an interaction between like the three of us right now. Um, You'd never really have or infrequently have an interaction with a million people at a time. And so you think about if those moments, those real in the small moments are satisfying or or rich moments, then you're living a satisfying and rich life. Um, That's so I kind of. That's where I try to put my mind a lot when I'm frustrated by events in the world. Yeah, well, I mean, there are a lot of events in the world, whether it's COVID or, or, you know, racial injustice protests or anything. There's always things to to concern ourselves with. And it's it's so when you say like your list is boring, I think it's remarkable. I mean, I think you listed seven things off the top of your head that you are and had them rank Mm. ordered. I mean, that's. You know, some people would struggle to do too, you know, like they can really get down on themselves. So it's, it's good to have someone saying, these are the things that I like and I do. And I'm not even a good hockey player. It's like, I can play the guitar, I can play the harmonica, um, but I'm not good at them. You wouldn't, if you're a musician, you'd be like, yeah, you can play a bunch of open chords. That's really good. But no right. thanks on jamming with us, you know, because <laughs> like, I don't know the right. rules, you know, so yeah, it's a good thing. You talked about math and, and looking mm-hmm. at, um, you know, just problems and solving those things when we talked before off mic. And I'm curious what your thoughts are when, um, you know, we see all the COVID modeling and, and the struggles we've had because the people who don't understand modeling, and I only have just slightly better than a layman's, you know, ability to talk about this, but models are the starting point. You know, it's like the cone mm-hmm. for a hurricane, but even broader. We're like, it's kind of a fan. It's a circle. We don't really mm-hmm. know. But talk about the challenge of doing something like modeling on a global scale for for a pandemic with a bazillion variables. 
Yeah, I think that one of the things that is often not communicated when we're doing science communication and mathematical communication is that science is a way of explaining what we see and trying to predict what we might see next. It's not, we're not speaking about a fundamental truth of the world. We're talking about stuff that we've seen and trying to predict. And so that's hard. Um, and there are certain things that seem really easy, like if I open up my hand and my keys are in it, they're going to fall. That seems like a really easy way to, to, um, to sort of conclusion to make. <clears throat> when you're dealing with things like an epidemic, there's a lot of complex variables happening there. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to consider and interacting effects. So, you know, recently there was a, this hype about this thing where the cubic model came up and it came out of, uh, you know, public policy. We came up with a cubic model of the pandemic. And um, what does that mean? That means that, and I'm just being slightly technical for a second, that means that it's a third order polynomial. It goes like X cubed plus X squared plus X plus a constant. Um, so it's a third order polynomial. And it is to professionals who study epidemics um, absolutely wrong. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I put together a blog on that where I sort of showed some visualizations why it doesn't make sense. And it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to be wrong. But when you're dealing with things that are so um, important, I mean, these are crucial, right? When, when you put together a bad model and you say to the world, hey, this is all going to go away like magic. You're, and if it was me just saying this out of you know, my office in Highland Park, it'd be one thing. But when you're saying it from a national stage, it's another. The mathematics around how to model an epidemic are well studied. They have been around... Uh, epidemiology has been around for a very long time, and there's a, a famous plot. I think it was uh, a guy's name was Snow. Somebody's going to correct me on this, but I think his name was Snow, and he plotted um, how a well had created uh, an epidemic in a small London town. We know what to do. We know how to do it. People have been doing it for almost a century or, or over, over a century, um, and it involves some harder math. And so when you abuse the mathematics like that for a political point, it makes me very angry, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, because it's irresponsible. You want to iterate towards good solutions, but when a good solution exists, that's where you want to iterate from, right? Standing on the shoulders of giants, every scientist talks about it. Like we see far only because we stand on the shoulders of giants and people have been there, have been here before using differential equations, using epidemiological models, using dynamical systems to figure out how a pandemic might spread. And that knowledge was hard won and should be respected. Um, so if anybody's interested, they can jump over to our blog at Verdon AI. And I have a whole uh, exposition with a little bit of mathematical profanity. Um, a friend of mine called it math wrath um, <laughs> around how this, this is done correctly. You know, how, how a, a, forgive the phrase, but how a grown up approaches these sorts of problems. They're important problems. They need to be correctly um, a model. I told Sandra she could have the next question, but I'm going to jump in on her real quick. When you're putting <laughs> these equations together, yeah, how oh, yeah, do you... I mean, I just told you, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear to God, you can have the next one. But uh, when you God. go to account for things like, like, do you put a giant kappa for Carese and, and political <laughs> influence? Because you cannot solve a big problem like this if both sides are pulling at each other. You know, I mean, look mm -hmm. at the mask conversation has changed. I think I, last time I counted was 10 times. So I mm -hmm. don't know what to believe. I don't know what'll be true tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then I've, you know, I've got these political factions pulling at my interest and, right. and my solution set. I mean, look at how challenging it is to look at. You're in LA County. I'm in Orange County. You know, Utah. Three totally different outcomes for for how mm -hmm. this works. And then politically, three different places too. Right. Well, you know, I'm 51 years old. I've been I've been doing mathematical modeling for a long time and AI for a long time. Um, I remember back in the 80s, a show called the McNeil Lair News Hour, uh, which some oh. listeners may or may not remember, but it was a news hour. It was a news program on PBS, and they were famous for doing, um, you know, uh, balanced arguments. They'd have in somebody from one side of the spectrum, somebody on the other side of the spectrum. And then the listener was encouraged to think critically. The listener was encouraged to follow the argument and develop their own opinion. And you know, that is what is not being encouraged by the media anymore. Um, even with my, you know, I have a particularly left bent on my politics, but I don't even feel like the left wing media is encouraging me to think critically through problems all the time. Sometimes they are. And I know the right wing media is doing the same thing with their listeners. They're encouraging them on some issues to think critically and on other issues to not. As a scientist, uh, I try to obey that tradition of sort of methodological thinking, of data driven, evidence based, hypothesis based thinking. Um, and I have to remind myself that 
the majority of people trust scientists. That's true still to this 538, just did a great poll on that. People still trust science. Science is not a natural way to think about things. And additionally, somebody pointed out recently, I think it was David Deutsch, the physicist, pointed out that science is less than 100 years old. Like the scientific thinking, like how yeah. we do science, not like the act of collecting evidence, but the actual scientific method is less than 100 years old. So people haven't had enough socialization on how to think critically like that, and they're not getting it as much. But as my buddy Dan Sorger likes to point out, this is um, a good time to be alive. And, and the debates that we're sparking and the uh, conversations we're having, even if they're highly polarized, polarized, are really bringing us to a point where we, we're all realizing that, I think, I think a lot of people are realizing that they're hyper-polarized, and now we have to go back to this critical thinking, this sort of deliberative thought, um, a scientific way of thinking, and, and start seeking out things more like McNeil Lair News Hour rather than you know, whatever extremist media that you're interested in, in pursuing. And I feel like that's happening in my personal life. I've been learning to be a lot more tolerant of, um, uh, of people with strongly opposing views, even things that I find extremely like core ideology, uh, you know, around like sexual identity or racism. Those are things that I'm, I'm very uh, opinionated on and in the ways you would expect, but trying to hear why when somebody reacts towards some sort of identity uh, issue, why they react that way and trying to understand, can I unpack where they're coming from and get to the root issue. Because I don't think, in, you know, people aren't born racist. They're taught to be racist. Actually, that's even, you know, going on too long, but that's even too much of a trope because some people, are, because people kind of are born racist in a certain way. Yeah. We know that there's xenophobia that is sort of in, implicit in animals uh, in every mammal that comes before us. So there's gotta be some sort of xenophobia within us because we're a natural creature, but you can train that out. And why wasn't it trained out of some people? Uh, why wasn't it socialized to a better world? Not sure, but we can do it. We know we can do it. So I'm going to pause there because I feel like I'm getting really soapboxy right now. <laughs> um, yeah, you actually talked about so many different things, and I, I always appreciate your perspective um, because I, I do think it is based, you know, a lot in, you know, the scientific method, which is, you know, really, you know, drives everything, you know, your foundation, I guess. Um, but I, I, you know, there's a few things that, you know, I think are interesting. Um, I love that you said that, you know, that being a dad is your number one motivating factor. And I think that explains mm -hmm. a lot about, um, you, I think your curiosity about the world and your openness, your openness to um, accept new ideas, and, and also, you know, what you pursue, um, you know, from a business perspective. So I'd love to just kind of, you know, unpack that a little bit, you know, about, you know, what, what I, I really think that you, you're an individual that sees it as your responsibility to leave the world a better place. Um, mm -hmm. I just kind of, you know, I want to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think if, if, if you know, um, you go to the Verdon website, of course, you see that we are like, we're a values driven organization. And my father was a prosecutor. Um, and my father was not a role model. I'm going to be upfront about that. My father was not a role model, but he did fight for justice, you know, and that was one of the things that was core to his worldview <clears throat> on one level. On another level, it was not core at all. And you look at these, um, this dichotomy of what it means to be a value-driven person and what it means to have gone through the experiences I've had that have trained me to, on some really, really specific skills, on things that, um, you know, not a lot of people have, have, had, have had access to learn. I went to one of the best universities in the world for mathematics. Um, I've studied at some of the, under some of the greatest minds uh, in the field. I have been part of enormous institutions. I've been very, very lucky to learn from a lot of people and learn things that are inaccessible to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the population. Um, people aren't really going to get the, the chance to learn the level of mathematics I've learned or, um, or the experience at the government organizations or institutions I've been at. So I feel fortunate in that. And I feel that, you know, it's, it all comes down to Spider-Man, right? Like um, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And I don't know if I have great power, but I have uh, abilities that other people are not, haven't had a chance to learn. Um, and maybe someday they will, and I hope they do. But now that I have those, if I have um, this, ability to affect change in a positive way, I'm obligated to do so. You know, I feel obligated to do so. And if, and if you're saying, where does that word, where does that obligation come from? Well, I'm a dad, right? I have a world that's coming after me 
that uh, I need to preserve for my children and my children's children and your children. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you know, the people I'm living with now, not just the, not just the future. I'm not ignoring the fact that there's a lot happening in the world. So with all of that, on a more practical level, Verdant is an opportunity for myself and my team to do value driven things, uh, to do things where we decide we're going to do this effort, even if it's not going to be as lucrative because it has a positive impact on how we want to see the world progress. And so we work a lot uh, in um, clean tech. We're working in agricultural tech um, endeavor right now where we're trying to help with carbon sequestration and reversing climate change. And we're doing that through market forces. Um, I believe that you know you have to use market forces wisely. I don't think that the government can come in by fiat to fix things. So we have uh, a, a project we're calling Biomass One where we're helping people uh, reuse agricultural waste and either sequester carbon or create clean energy. And in doing so, we're creating a whole um, economy where people can do the right thing with their land and um, and also be profitable. And you know, one of the things I like to point out is that many of these farmers know that they're doing the wrong thing when they're covering their um, their crops with pesticides. I mean, I don't know if you heard about the soybean thing this morning or the couple, last couple of days. They know they're doing the wrong thing, but they don't have much of a choice. And they know that if they can do the right thing, right. they have better land to pass on to their children. So that intergenerational tra transfer is really important. And we want to make sure that we can participate in that. And that's just that's one thing we're interested in. And we have half a dozen others in, in digital health um, and you know social justice. These are things that are important to us that Verdon really stands for. And we're um, spending as much time as we can on, on those projects. We had Dr. Stephen running on the show a couple of times. He won a Nobel Peace Prize Ooh. with uh, Al Gore in, I think, 2006, wasn't that, when they won that wow. thing? Ooh. Yeah, and he's a climatologist at University of Montana. And he, I was asking him, because we talk a lot about global climate change. Mm -hmm. And well, this is an aside, but this is kind of a funny aside. Like, during the last couple mm -hmm. of weeks, we've learned two things uh, that we didn't know before because of COVID and then the, uh, you know, the panic and then also all of the, uh, the social rights, the horrors of George Floyd being killed. Oh. Mm. Um, the second amendment argument is largely over because you'd have to know that police cannot always show up and protect you. Like we've sort of seen that mm -hmm. now. And we also know that humans have a direct impact on the environment because we've all been driving less and the earth is thanking us for it. So we have mm -hmm. to juggle these complex social concepts, you know, that, that are, that are not easy to get through. Um, when you, when you look at problems, you know, from the mathematical sense and, you know, the farmer's like, Hey, I've got to make this much money per hectare to, to exist, you know, mm -hmm. to even to do it. How do you, how do you help them as a, as a mathematician, you know, how do you help them solve that problem? Because it's, it's scary to look at change, you know, farmers are conservative by nature because what they do works. Why am I going to mess with it? You know, and yet with that said, mm -hmm. they've got robot tractors and all kinds of ways. Combines exist for that reason. How do you approach that mathematically to figure out what it takes to make someone spray less pesticides or, you know, uh, process mm -hmm. their land in a different way because it's one thing to say look out for our kids in the future but it's another thing to, to produce a reliable repeatable reliable and repeatable right, right. scientific method yeah. result yeah yeah absolutely and, and you know make predictions that you can execute right so yeah farmers have to play a much longer game than most of us do right uh, most uh, farms get contracted out for the next five ten sometimes even 20 years like if you're going to grow poplar trees you're doing a 15 year contract so you're going to invest in what's going to happen 15 years from now. And I was talking to a guy in uh, Georgia who's part of the Georgia Forestry Commission, and he was talking about how a lot of the farmers in this, uh, the Southwest or Southeast feel like they, you know, they got a raw deal because 20 years ago they were told plant trees and we will buy the trees and we'll have carbon sequestration and everything will be great. And they did. And now they have this land full of trees they can't really sell. Um, there's just too much, too much on the market. Um, aren't enough purchasers, Logistic, logistics and supply have been disrupted even before COVID. So now they're feeling really frustrated. They did the right thing and they knew that they wanted to do the right thing, but now the market isn't supporting them. Um, and that's you know disheartening to all of us. Uh, these are people who are uh, not making huge windfall profits every year. Maybe with the large aggregate farms are, but these are hardworking people who are, you know, have to watch a budget and have to play a long game, which is a harder thing the most people who have a nine to five have to deal with. They don't have to play a long game. Where am I going to be in five, 10, 15 years right. from 
exactly where I am. Am I going to keep my office job for the next 15 years? Probably not. They are. They're going to be on that same office for the next 15 years. So in terms of how do you approach that mathematically, I would say you don't really approach it mathematically. Uh, you know, I, on my, my LinkedIn profile, I like to put mathematical entrepreneur. And so I like to consider myself a bit of both. Uh, I like to consider myself a lot of things that I'm probably not, but um, <laughs> just ask my kids about all the things I'm not. Um, <laughs> but the entrepreneurial side is to look at this and say, this is a problem in the market. How do we uh, create a, a more dynamic market? And then that's where the math comes from at that point, where you say like, well, if I can optimize uh, the supply chain here, um, you know, I can create more liquidity and they can move value that they have on their land. They can move that value into, you know, into the market. There's optimizations to be done there from an algorithmic point of view. That is not really the focus uh, with, with Biomass One at the moment. We're building to that. Our focus right now is to just immediately enable people the opportunity or give people the opportunity to sell their, their agricultural waste. Like, for instance, cow manure is actually a very valuable asset. It, you, can, you can use it. You can put it into a digester and create clean natural gas. You can dehydrate it and create fertilizer. Um, the problem is it has a limited sort of range that you can sell it. So if you're going to pick it up, you can't sell it to somebody 300 miles away because it's just not worth the shipping. The freight comes in, and right. that's the big limiter. But if you can sell it to somebody 15 to 20 miles away or under 60 is sort of the rule of thumb with a lot of these things, then you sell it to them. They can get it cheaply, and then you create an asset on your farm, and you've provided them with a cheaper alternative to buying gas or uh, buying fertilizer. So – the problem, the reason people aren't doing that is it's really difficult to find, to connect buyers and sellers. So the number one thing to do is to connect buyers and sellers um, within your region, within a certain logistical um, parameters. There are constraints you have to deal with, but we know because, because Wendy Owens, who's been uh, heading this charge, we know that people need that. We know that when we say, hey, you should meet this person, they'll buy your stuff, they buy it. Liquidity occurs. And so that's the first thing we're trying to solve. Then we're dealing with sort of the mathematical optimization problem afterwards. And then the bigger question, uh, back to, again to st Dr. Stephen Running, I, when I asked him, I said, global climate change mm -hmm. sounds like the war on terror. Sounds like the war on drugs. Sounds like the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. The war on drugs sounds like the war on poverty. Mm -hmm what like no shit what is the goal yeah. here? like what are we going for you're the climatologist and he said we need to get uh, for a goal and then we can work from there we need to get the i think it was 400 parts per million way above the historic mm -hmm. norm but, but with modern technology we can probably manage that and that's a doable mm -hmm. thing so one let's quit burning coal when i give mm -hmm. you that from one of the smartest climate minds in the world how do we do that? Is that where the market is oriented? You know, I, I mean, just and not to attack what you guys are doing, but this is science, right? It's hard. So as soon as you say carb carbon sequestration, you know, and someone's like, we've got kelp ladders. And then I read an article from a peer reviewed journal. that's like, hey, kelp ladders are creating more um, gas than we thought. And we realized like, no, now, now it's not kelp ladders. And, you know, because science turns out science is not mm -hmm. exact. It moves around quite a bit. Right. <laughs> so when I give you the number 400, you know, what do you what do you think about that? How do you how do you fall in line with with that? Or is that is that not what you guys are trying to do goal wise? Well, you know, we're trying to get there. We're trying to support that. We're trying to support uh, many of the goals and it being acknowledging that there's a couple things to play. First of all, science is not exact, right? Like it's an iterative process. The the important thing about it is not deciding that the paper you read last week is the be all end all. It's deciding that the paper you read last week is a step along the way to greater understanding of what we need to do. Right. And and being tolerant of the fact that that person might have been wrong or that person might have been right. You might have been wrong and they're right, you know, and there's a whole truth table that goes on. And that's really a, a challenge, I think, just back to the earlier part of our conversation around having um, a deliberative mindset. And by deliberative, I mean, you know, procedural thinking through the arguments, respectfully sort of understanding the, the axiomatic approach. So uh, on that one side, you know, kelp ladders really cool. It's interesting. I studied kelp in graduate school. That's what my graduate work was in. And you, you start to think, oh, maybe this isn't the solution. So right. where do we go next? How do we get to the solution? 
And when we talk about, you know, the war on drugs and these other massive pushes and climate change being like that, I agree. I think that one of the things, you know, we know that the war on drugs is not particularly successful. And part of that was, the, were there real mandates there? Were there real incentives for people to clean things up? And was it beyond just sort of a government mandate? And I think that there's so much interesting stuff uh, happening in the climate change arena right now where people are trying to find market forces to affect climate change. And not all of them are going to be right. And some of them are really interesting. And some of them just seem kind of silly, honestly. But I like that people are experimenting. You know, <laughs> yeah, There's some really silly ones out there. Um, I like that people are experimenting with market forces to, to reduce carbon emissions. And one of the things that I've learned, you know, I, you're learning all the time. And one of the things that was interesting to me about carbon sequestration, we know that sequestration needs to happen because basically we did desequestration and that's what got us into this mess, right? So we can get the carbon back into a fixed place. Then we know we can, re we can affect climate change. I mean, Los Angeles is a great example. Our air has been cleaned over the past two months. It's pretty amazing. And one of the ways you can sequester carbon is by um, wood alternatives in construction. So if you use like bamboo or, um, uh, or giant reed, and you turn that into plywood, you know, what you would call plywood, you've now sequestered that carbon and that carbon stays in a building for a hundred years. If you can find concrete alternatives, uh, like hempcrete is interesting. I don't know how it's doing, but it's an interesting idea that we're turning hemp into concrete. Uh, that sequesters carbon, right? So you can actually sequester carbon in buildings. Um, and that is something I was not particularly aware of, honestly. And as I've learned about these market forces, you're thinking, well, you know, these wood alternatives are cheaper, they're more available, they're local, so that you can reduce the footprint of moving them from here to, you know, around the world. Those are great alternatives. Let's like, let's find a thousand of those and pick up on 50 of them that work. And so Verdon is really about looking through as many of these ideas as we can and trying to find ones that we understand, because there's probably some great ones out there that we don't understand, but trying to find the ones that we understand and we feel like we can contribute to and push that forward. So are we going to get to that 400 number? Well, hopefully we'll be a, a small part of that. If not a, like a drone parachute slowing down the, the rise, you know, and just over right. time build up. Because <laughs> you're right, there are a thousand products created by 10,000 different people. And, and then we just keep mm -hmm. doing that. And, and there are a lot of different solutions. One of the solutions for, again, from talking to Dr. Running is, is taking the efficiency of petrochemicals and really getting a lot mm -hmm. more power out of it, you know, and, and yeah. redesigning how we use, because like, part of the problem is, is that we're terrified of nuclear and, and damn, you know, petrochemicals are extremely powerful in terms of energy yeah. density. You know, and it's like, we yeah, can, the energy is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So it's hard to ignore that because that's always worth money. It's like saying, hey, platinum will solve the problem, but we're going to deal with plastic. You know, like it's, right. it's really mm -hmm. hard to get by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that there's some, some, there's a whole field. This is going to be really dirty because this is not where you expect me to take it, but there's a whole field of computational chemistry, right? That is interesting to me because it's computational. And I know I've had a couple of years of chemistry in college. And it's being supported by um, the new advances in quantum computing. So like computational chemistry is heavily compute intensive. It's like even more so than weather forecasting, um, which you know people are already relying on high performance computing to accomplish. And now with quantum coming along, the computational chemistry is, uh, is also coming along there. Now it's not ready yet, the, the quantum part isn't, but the computational chemistry is. And that is about how do I unpack um, methane or um, uh, octane, how do I unpack that and uh, retrieve as much energy as possible? Or how do I use blends of different materials to create octane yeah. that will unpack that? So that is a huge modeling problem um, that has been really mostly accessible only to the larger uh, institutions because of the compute power. You need to spend a lot, you need a lot of electrons to do this. Now, there's a lot of motion in the high performance computing world right now um, including one of my favorites is this uh, project called Chapel out of the guys who built the Cray machines. Um, and it's allowing people at home to do versions of high performance computing, which is pretty amazing. So all the SETI at home stuff mm -hmm. can be accelerated by these uh, this, this sort of commoditized HPC. So when we're looking at how do we get the most out of a molecule, well, that's a, that's a chemistry problem. Right, and can be solved with math. Well, not solved. It can be approached with math. I, I hesitate to say anything is solved, um, <laughs> but it can be approached with mathematically. Um, 
those are definitely endeavors that uh, I'm interested in approaching. It is not something I'm actively working on right now. But you're right. The energy density of of octane of these sort of carbon based fuels is incredible. Um, you know, it's it's no match for the nuclear, as you pointed out. But you know, nuclear comes with a lot of problems that I think are legitimate. I think that you know, um, people are. I, I personally feel like nuclear nuclear power is fairly safe and fairly clean. Right. Um, to for the most part, there's still problems with it. Um, it is one of those things that you can point to a specific place and be afraid of. <laughs> which is not the same thing as petrochemical production, right? Like you can't point and go, oh my God, you can see the offshore oil rigs, but like if you started pointing at where you're afraid of, uh, you know, petrochemical going wrong, it's the parking lot, you know, the car is 50 feet from me right now. So I think you've, it's become normalized. So I think it's natural to kind of go, oh my God, this is too scary. And, right. and then, you know, if you watch Chernobyl, that was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of but has had a, a Jaws it. effect, right? You know, we have some, some yeah. I'll say minor, if that's possible, meltdowns. And then, right, yeah, right. you know, you have that, that China syndrome and, and Chernobyl. Uh, you know, it is, it's terrifying. And you're more okay, scared yeah. of yeah. nuclear than you probably should be. Wow. There was this book that came, sorry, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead, please. Okay. I don't I want to say, there, This book that came out, about Renaissance capital called When Genius Failed. Um, and I, I guess the book probably came out, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, it's a story of, of, of um, a long-term capital management, the company that, that, uh, that, you know, amassed billions of dollars and suddenly failed. And part of the problem is that they were trading, they were doing algorithmic trading on, on NASDAQ. And they became, it, what the, the, the arc of the story is, they became so successful they couldn't trade with anybody else. And they, um, and they fell apart. And the title, I read the book, it was a fascinating book, and it's a fascinating sort of account of what you could do algorithmically with, with um, mathematics and sort of time series analysis. And, but I get to the end, it's like, genius didn't fail. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, genius won in this one. Like, like the, the math won, the math worked, all of that stuff worked. What happened was a managerial catastrophe, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they became greedy, they became concerned about their own careers, about their own returns. Um, and that's exactly the story of Chernobyl, right? Like even even independent of how the the, the film portrayed it for dramatic effect, right. um, these disasters are managerial problems, um, which are real problems, right? So you can point in the science and go like nuclear, you know, nuclear energy is as clean as you want to say it is. It's fairly clean. It has waste. It's a problem. Right. But you want to say, hey, it's super clean. We can't, you know, there's no reason to be afraid of it. It's like, well, the people running it are the reason you should be afraid of it. Um, and that could be improved upon but i don't want to trivialize it either and say like oh people who don't believe in nuclear power are lame because they don't get it it's like you know they they think they're responding to the science but really they're responding to is the lack of sort of uh correct management of it you know that's the problem you really want to worry about who are the people that are pushing the buttons yeah well yeah it was it was nuclear experts that blew up chernobyl right like and that and that has yeah. happened and then there's there's behavioral models like they've done science scientific study on this where they say Brian, here is the problem in Africa. You have to fix this problem. And you start twisting the knobs. And we get to this point where as humans, we just start careening from left to right and we overcorrect, mm -hmm. which, you know, we're seeing right now, like with our reactions to everything, we overcorrect yes. and, and quickly lose control of the, the outcome. It's, it's, uh, it's a dramatic, yeah. uh, you know, it's a dramatic thing to think about, like how often we're wrong and it to totally incapable of understanding that that's true. Right. Well, the, the hard part is to appreciate being wrong, right? Like, <laughs> like, um, I mean, it's just, it's good to be wrong. It's, I used to tell my kids when I was teaching them ice skate, if you're not falling, you're not learning. Right. It's just like, that's just how you have to look at the world. It hurts to land on your elbow, but that's how you have to look at the world. Um, I remember, uh, when I was just learning to code, I came across some post. I was trying to figure out why my code wasn't compiling. And somebody said to me, yeah, you're, you're viewing this wrong when you get this, um, the stack trace and you get the, the error log, you're viewing it as the enemy when really it's your friend telling you exactly what the problem is. So every time it just barks onto the screen that you've missed all these things and this is, you know, error here, that's your friend telling you what you're doing wrong. And, uh, you know, that's, that is the hardest thing to sort of appreciate. It's like, let's be wrong a lot. Um, but and let's be sympathetic when somebody else is wrong. <laughs> no matter how horrific their point of view might seem to you at some point, be sympathetic. They're wrong for a reason. Um, they have a reason for, for what they're doing. Um, it might be a psychotic reason, might be pathological, but until you know that it's pathological, just assume that they have an actual legitimate analytic reason for getting there. 
you know, your point about Africa is interesting as well. I'm on um, part of a group that does uh, investment, impact investment in Africa, and I'm on these calls called The Nest, organized by this guy named Kim Chu. He's really fantastic. He's done a great job. And one of the things that, you know, I don't want to say it's a criticism, but an observation I made is that when you have a bunch of people trying to invest in companies who are traditional investors, they have a set of values that they're trying to get to. Yep. And they're trying to get to returns. They want to get their ROI. They want to look at your run rate. And that's fine. But I think it's more fine if you're in California, right? If you're looking at these things that are, um, uh, you know, not seriously impacting the quality of life of everybody that's being affected. So it's a little bit of a luxury to think about, you know, do I get a 3x return or a 5x return? I think that if you get a 1.1x return and you've improved somebody's lives, that's maybe how you should look at the world. Mm. <laughs> you know, so I'm on these calls and I'm sometimes like, I know why you're answering that question. It's a very good financial question, but are you in the right place if that's your instinct? I'll give you an example. Well, I won't give you a specific example, but I'll give you a, a, a theater of an example. One of the things I'm learning is that many of the African companies, the biggest thing that they're worried about is people getting killed on their mopeds right, or their scooters or however they want to describe them. But apparently there's no emergency service in huge swaths of Africa. You know, surprise, surprise. It's a, it doesn't have the infrastructure that we do. If you get killed by a car, you don't have insurance. You have to pay for it yourself to go to the hospital. And there's a lot of startups that are trying to, uh, trying to figure this out. Like, how do we provide medical assistance to somebody who just got hit by a car? And they have some ideas on how you can monetize that and make it pay for itself. Yeah it's not going to make a billion dollars, right? And if you invest in that, you know, at worst, you're going to lose your $100,000, um, but probably at least one or two people are going to be better off. <laughs> yeah. know? And it's just like, it's a different, it's a different way of looking at the world that they are trying to adapt their questions and their business to a Western model of finance, as opposed to, and I don't like to use the term Western, but so like a Silicon, mo a Silicon Valley model of finance as opposed to trying to find market forces that are implicit in their native economy that can be translated to an investment there. And I think there's a lot of work that's left to be done on that. Like how do you use the native economy in a way that makes sense for the, oh, the, the local economy? Yeah, you know? this is vital. And, and I'm stomping all over Sandra. I apologize, Sandra. Let me just yeah, ask one more. Don't even worry, it's fine. <laughs> so <laughs> because of my work overseas, I, I've seen a lot of the problems that happen. Like we have these great solutions, for example, uh, US ag will go out and try to help Africa, whatever it's going to be. But the ground truth is so far from the reality. So, you know, there you are off in an office and you're saying, given this, given this, then, you know, doing if then test, we'll have this positive outcome. I go out and I'm like, yeah, there's no fire department here. You're studying for stability. There's no ATM. There's no way to safely transmit money. There's no way to, there's no way to, and it's like, well, we didn't know all that when we figured the solution mm. out. And, and it's the simplest, smallest, impossible for someone in an ivory tower. And God bless the ivory tower. We need those guys too. But when I would go out, I would say, like, what's the problem we can solve right now today? Like, what's one thing? And it was mm -hmm. like, can you move this piece of concrete wall so our kids could go right across the street to school? And then mm. we could do that. And now there is the solution right. that instantly created a micro improvement in stability, you know? Yeah, you and I had a great conversation the other day about these local sort of constraints that would not occur to me right. sitting in my office in Los Angeles. You know, uh, one of the constraints, and I hope you don't mind me bringing it up, Please. But like, was cult culturally um, people growing grapes. Have you shared that with your listeners? Can you retell uh, maybe, that story? Yeah, yeah. so basically it, in Afghanistan, we had a, a program. Yeah. We knew they grew grapes and we're like, if you grow them on a trellis, they will uh, produce better for you and you'll get a higher yield uh, on your crop. That's great and true. And they know that because they're grape farmers and they know. But if they do that, it's an indication of Western influence and it will get them targeted, if not killed. Like it will draw attention. And even if that's not true, their perception is, is that the Taliban will recognize that and my family's safety will be less. So here we have this right. thing where you can grow bigger grapes. However, it's not worth my life to do that. Right. I find that fascinating on a lot of levels, on some levels that are horrifying and I'm one that I want to kind of bring back to like a, a, a psychologically less frightening place. Uh, <laughs> and that is it's sort of the, you know, one of the, when I'm in, when I introduce myself, I often talk about cybernetics. Um, cybernetics is the studies of the study of systems. And I often 
caution people around AI and machine learning that the, the system only knows what you tell it. And if nobody told somebody that like grape trellis is a, a social indicator that is vital, yeah, it's never, no AI in the world is going to figure that out, right? It's never going to figure that out. And so, you know, th- this domain knowledge that you have from simple conversations, like in the small, like I talked about this earlier, you know, like these, these moments in the small unpack information, super you know, incredibly vital. It's like maybe the most vital piece of information that you obtained in that whole effort was what, like a five minute conversation with maybe yeah. one person. Yeah. You know, you yeah. write out the text and it's like 60 lines of text or something. Well, um, the other you know, thing, so you don't, yeah. go ahead. The, the other thing is, is that we'll pour money into the bathtub trying to help, you know, people out. But there are so many holes in the bathtub, the money just runs right through it because the problem mm-hmm. we're trying to solve is more important than the bathtub being full of water. I hope that analogy makes sense, but you cannot fill Straight, the bathtub yeah. fast enough because there's so many needs. And we look at that like mm-hmm. corruption. And then I'm like, no, we're corrupting. Like we're filling this stupid bathtub full of money right. and they're all desperate for what's in the bathtub. So they just drill holes in it. So you'll never fill the bathtub up and right. you'll never be able to at better place that money with more, uh, a more deliberate approach, you know, and again, get to the ground and find out what they need. And a farmer will say, feed and seed, feed and seed. That's what mm-hmm. I need. I don't need, I'm not going to hire people. My family's going to bring in the crop. I'm never going to change that feed and seed. And we're like, they right. need apricots. They need, you know, <laughs> right. access to the uh, you know, inner Asian market and all these other things. Right. Yeah. Feed and seed. <laughs> that's what they need. Right. <laughs> now, now you're a poet. You sound a little Jesse Jackson right there. <laughs> feed that's and right. seed. That's what they need. <laughs> and I think you're right. And I think that, you know, respecting that sort of, um, sub game if you will like you know not to belittle it game to me is an important mathematical thing right not like right. not like a triviality um in respecting that sub game that these actors in this system have this immediate need and that's all they're ever going to need and that's what you need to obey and then try to take one granular step back and say like with those as given methods with as given constraints how do you create a system around them that supports them um, as opposed to kind of going into their sub game and trying to change their rules, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in business. I mean, people yeah. do it all the time. This is why a lot of like major projects I've seen in industry fails. Like the CEO decides that they're going to move everything to this data platform or whatever, whatever it is. And by fiat, it's just supposed to happen, but it doesn't respect all the sub games that are being played out throughout the organization. That's a much less dire example than the one you're using. I don't have that on the ground experience and I'm slightly envious and slightly thankful. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I like to use fiat. Can we use the word diet? Like we had a diet in worms again and we decided to save the world. Yeah. Okay. So there's my diet and fiat <laughs> joke. Let me ask you this though. So when we deal with, cause you guys deal with environmental type type issues, we had mm-hmm. we had Fabian Cousteau on, and he talked about how most of the air wow. we breathe comes from the ocean. Like it's our lungs, mm-hmm. and uh, yes, the Amazon's yeah. a big vital part of that. But you can't outdo the ocean. There's so much in it, and, and we haven't studied it like we want to study space and everything else. Mm-hmm. So we have this ocean system, we have this terrestrial system, and then we have the the climate system. You know, and these are they're very interdependent mm-hmm. things. We're trying to figure this out. And again, Dr. Stephen Running says, hey, great, go explore for petroleum. But as other gases leave, those are our natural resources. We demand that you capture them and put them to work. Right. Don't let them just fly into the atmosphere. Like if you're going to take this money and make make it, you know, these are our resources. Get that stuff. You know, so all these different systematic demands. And again, like we're not, we're not wanting less heavy uh, metals. We want more of those things. So we're going to scratch more mm-hmm. holes into the ground and tear down more mountains and all these other things. And all. So how do we balance these systems, man, that are like the ocean is tough to get to. Uh, we want more and more metal for our day-to-day lives. And, and we're trying to get less carbon in the air, but we're not doing or demanding less of the earth. Yeah, well, I know the answer. I'm just not going to tell everybody. Okay. (laughs) So, you know. Can it be that I get to eat more carbohydrates? I would like it to be more carbohydrates for me so I can eat some delicious desserts. Yeah, it's french fries. I'm just going to get this. (laughs) Well, you know, there's there's a certain, my my outside view of how these problems get addressed. Um, I mean, my internal view is different, but there's a certain parochialism that happens when people are worried about their part of it. So like you just mentioned three major systems, right? Like we have, um, you have the climate, 
we have the oceans and we have the rainforest, right? Like the, the big three, kind of the big three of, of uh, climate change, right? Um, those are important systems. I think that there's a reason that people want to crawl down onto the bottom of the rainforest and look at the spores that are coming up and see their contributions. And there's a reason that people want to think about, you know, um, micro kelp that exists, like these tiny little algae that exist that are providing oxygen. Um, dealing at a higher, more complicated level is actually just, it becomes a very sophisticated system to, to study. And I think that that's challenging. Um, and um, I think that there's not a bridge between the guy who studies spores and the guy who studies climate change to think about an integrated system all the way up. From a compute point of view, it's really hard. Um, you know, from a different system of differential equations point of view, also still pretty hard. The hardest part though, is from an incentive point of view. Um, you know, if somebody said to me that the only thing you have to do for the rest of your career is to work towards a unified climate model um, that, that incorporates the spores uh, all the way up to the winds and, you know, the magnetosphere, I would be delighted. Um, the problem is, you know, I'd have to get paid to do that somehow. My team would have to get paid to do that. Um, that's just hard to do. And, and it would be 15 years before I could publish a single paper, right? So if I'm an academic and I'm rewarded on the number of papers I'm, publish, I'm publishing, then I'm not going to get there. Um, if I'm a businessman, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to, you know, sell a webcam of me writing equations on the board. Like, <laughs> it's just really, it's not, it's not a, there's not a way to incentivize that behavior that's obvious to me. Um, there's probably little micro incentives around the world, but I'm not seeing them. But it's definitely definitely uh, a, an effort we need to take on. We need to think about these larger integrated solutions. I do think that there's a new set of mathematical tools that ha have come out that have been repopularized in the last 10 years called mean field game theory. Um, and mean field game theory talks about how you translate, uh, once again, a game from the small into a game in the large. Um, lots of great stuff coming out of France um, and, uh, and Canada in terms of this study. It's fascinating field to me. It allows us to have mathematical machinery that's a lot more um, elegant than trying to do the stuff we've been doing for climate modeling and for weather patterns and tornadoes. And it's pretty exciting stuff. It hasn't produced a lot of commercial, any commercial results so far as I know, maybe in financial mathematics. Um, and I've been studying a lot of that. So I'm hoping that for me, I'm not gonna be the guy that comes up with the model that helps everything, but I'm hoping that when the model starts to move forward, I'll be able to say something interesting about it and participate in that conversation because the mathematics is really fascinating. It's a new way of looking at um, large actor, large sets of actors and many, many agent phenomenon, which is exactly what we have with climate change. Lots of agents acting in their own best interest. You talked about when we were having our, our preliminary chat, and I, I love this because I, I like to talk about social problems are multivariate problems. And maybe I, I like, I'm not the mathematician, but maybe cubed multivariate problems mm -hmm. <laughs> and you you gave that great example of of p versus pi can you kind of talk about the complexity of the problems like you know for example with um you know g getting you know racial bias and everything and i would submit that race even politics can be accounted for at the genetic mm -hmm. level the dna level so when we look at these yeah. problems people are wired at least initially to do things like humans are pattern makers. I, I read, I read Frank mm -hmm. McCourt's fantastic book, Angela's ashes. If you guys haven't read that book, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's so good. But the racism and bigotry in that book is about where you're from in Ireland, what your religion was, you know, what kind of house you had. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not racism per se, but it's, it's what we do. I don't know that. I don't trust that. I don't like that. F you. Right. And then, we can evolve right. past that, as you said. So how do you get past that? So some, some racism is, is just a product of society, but some is just because that's how we got to this point by going bad, good, right. bad, good, you know, and sorting things. Yeah. It's, it's, it's healthy in different societies to be mistrusting of new people. There's a healthy response to that. Right. And if you want to abstract it away from people, cause you want to say, Oh no, how could that possibly be true? Let's put it this, do it this way. If you're living in uh, a natural setting, like you, you know, you're, you're tribalistic living, it is healthy to be wary of any new animal you come across, right? If it's a new animal, you're going to look at it and see how big are its teeth? <laughs> you know, does it have claws? Um, does it seem docile? And you're going to spend some time being wary of that thing. If it just walks into your campfire, you're going to be afraid of it at first. Um, 
And that's, that's healthy. That's, you know, genetic pre-programming and you should be. Um, and the reason you're wary of it is you're not sure of its capabilities, right? I mean, it's the obvious stuff. It's so obvious when I say it like that, when I say it about, oh, here's a new person walking in, then we have a modern sensibility that says, oh, you can't think that way. Like, can can oh, I jump in on this real quick? Going. My yeah, daughter and I have, yeah. have an example for this and, and we call him caveman. His name is Kevin. Yeah. And he was the guy that tried yeah. shit. <laughs> It's like, okay, try rocks. Bad? Okay, everybody, don't eat rocks. How about this rock that's in the fire pit? Ah, it burns my tongue. Don't eat that. You know, and so like you have these Kevin experiences where you learn like this snake is horrible, it will bite you. This snake bites you, and it's not as horrible. And and so you kind of we right. built these patterns. Sorry, please continue. No, no, you're totally right. And I love the movie Encino Man too. So um, <laughs> but more, I loved Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer. Uh, so um, <laughs> But I mean, if Kevin, the, the real lesson isn't people going, hey, look at how stupid Kevin is. His tongue's all burnt. The real lesson is Kevin didn't have any kids. Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's no grandchildren of Kevin now um, because he didn't make it. So like this notion that you're going to be wary of something that's unusual, really, really healthy. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you should be kind of wary, but you should also be socialized. So like then, then what kicks in? So like I've learned that, um, you know, uh, that Sandra is actually pretty nice. She walked into my campfire. She's actually pretty nice. She's not really a threat to me. Um, how do I pass that on? Uh, I can pass that on through direct example, but if I needed to get to my grandchildren, the fact that we have the language that creates this cultural history allows us to shape our instincts into a more socially acceptable view, uh, more socially acceptable behavior. So now the grandchildren of Sandra and the grandchildren of Brian are able to talk to each other in a nice way. So the racism that started off there has to be, can be overcome culturally. We know this to be true, you know, again and again and again and again, but it's also, let's not be ridiculous and think that there's not a reason for it. There's not a reason way deep down inside why people are a little bit xenophobic or why people are a little bit fearful, why people are, you know, too impulsive. Um, it doesn't make sense to sit there and calculate the running velocity of a lion before you decide to run away. There, you know, there is, just, there just is run. more complexity <laughs> to this, though. I mean, a lot of the narrative now inserts racism to defeat racism. You know, we can't mm -hmm. feed intolerance into the machine, right, the system, and expect tolerance to come out. Like, we have to all, everybody can work on being more tolerant, you know. And even mm -hmm. if things, ideas that make you uncomfortable, because if you feed in intolerance, you know, it's a, it's as simple as the garbage in, garbage out. And let's all understand intolerance for the most part, you know, in terms of social problems does not help solve the problem. Absolutely. Well, you know, we we were doing a, a thing on um, on addiction and recovery. We we're doing a mental health play. We've been working on that for a while. And in doing that, I researched all of the recovery, the existing recovery programs. Um, and because those are big behavioral change programs. Right. Absolutely. And it turns out. Yeah that you know, AA is the most successful recovery program of any sort of rehabilitation program out there that I was able to find. I'm pretty sure that's supported. I don't think I'll be challenged on that one. AA is great. And one of the central tenets of AA is I can't think my way into better acting, but I can act my way into better thinking. And so when I'm looking at things around social and economic factors, and all stupid things that I do or things that I look at myself and say I wasn't about my best self when I did that, the, the note I try to make to myself and the note I try to make to other people is just act differently the next time. Like just act differently. Even if you're feeling super racist, act non-racist. Just do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just do it. And, and that will get you to this place where you're not feeling that bile in your stomach. Um, we know this. Again, this is another very common, uh, commonly studied phenomenon. Act your way into better thinking. Um, and nobody has to I know. I want to jump in on this too. I keep doing this to you, but these are important no, please, illustration please, please. points. I, I want to be I delicate with the time. Uh, I do a thought oh, exercise yeah. with myself and other people that I've, I've learned to do through my time in conflict zones. And I, I'll give you a scenario when I say your team wins the world championship and there's rioting. What do you see? And it's a mm -hmm. motherfucker because you're like, I am the worst person right. on earth. You know, like you see things yeah. that are just completely unfair and and mm -hmm. and totally ignore most of the rest of the population, you know, or whatever that outcome is. And you can do this for any number of things where you just invent these things at a whole cloth as to like who is doing what and what's happening. And it's it's mm -hmm. like if you think you're not a horrible monster person, just do some of those thought exercises, and and you quickly understand you you know 
we have to readjust our thinking. Just like the yeah. assumptions we would make about folks who lived in a natural environment or, or whatever. You're in Afghanistan. What do I think I know about this person? Well, I think they're stupid. Okay, well, that's a mm-hmm. false narrative right from the start. I didn't start with that right. belief. I had to go, oh, well, that's not right. So, so here's an example. Um, we would go out and dig wells for people. This is a good thing. They need fresh water. Okay. Well, that's where the problems start because no one asked anybody if they needed a well, nor did they ask them where they should put it. And then when they ignore the well or they smash the well to pieces because they don't want to die because of the well, we think Mm -hmm. dumb people aren't able to work. And and you get all these absolutely false, you know, conclusions that come out of this thing because of our own you know, our own understanding of what's there without taking the time to even ask the fucking question as like, right. Hey, what would be the number one thing you guys need here? You know, feed and seed. Oh, okay. Not a well. Oh, yeah. we got water for days. We could yeah. get water out of the valley a little easier. Do you have a pump? Oh, well, shit. We mm-hmm. got pumps for days. You know, like, and you can solve oh, yeah, these we problems. Yeah, right, we got pumps those? for days. <laughs> but you'd have to go to your government and ask for it. Wait, that guy over there, he never does anything. Well, he has access to the pumps. See you later. You know, and then you walk away and then they go to the government and you have this tiny little win. But yeah. if you start off with they're dumb and they don't know how to do anything, you know, that's where we yeah. all fail. We all fail that way. Totally, totally. And once again, I'm, I'm, I'm both envious and horrified by the idea of having shared your experience. Like, <laughs> I would love to have had, I would love to have that learning directly because that's really sort of enviable that you were able to see these belief systems uh, so directly exposed. But at the same time, I would, you know, I don't think, I don't think. Do you know about liminality and like liminal space? It's, it's, I don't think I know that term. It's uh, you enter into someone else's reality. So like if I come to Verdant Mm -hmm. and I'm hanging out, I'm in your guys's kind of reality bubble. And if I'm able to translate that to like, say like an investor that you guys are trying to pitch, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they can't travel into the space. I can because, you know, I'm foreign to both things. And so mm-hmm. I'm able to pop into different liminal spaces. So the Afghan space, I can pop into that, understand their reality, and then communicate that back to the military, State Department, whatever, so that they can just kind of nudge. The, the realities will probably never overlap, but I can nudge them closer together so that they can work more collaboratively. It's impossible to do because everybody hates it when you do it because <laughs> they, de- no. they replace their reality for yours. But, you know, you try to create those scenarios. Th- that's the kind of agent of change you need, though, is someone who's a liminal traveler who's comfortable and can tolerate alternate realities. And that sounds way more mm-hmm. weird than it's supposed to be. But that's how I can explain mm-hmm. it. Now, whatever, hippie. Um, <laughs> no, you know, it's funny you bring that up because there's two examples that I know we're short on time, but let me let me jam out two examples really quick. The first one is I used to teach a class for incoming graduate students at, at UCLA on how to teach mathematics. And one of the things I used to say to them is, you know, it's the easiest way in the world to intimidate somebody is to put math in front of them, right? Because people have associated that with their intelligence and thence their self-worth and it's a bogus equivalent, uh, but it, it's how it works. So you have to respect that you as a teacher are presenting a terrifying subject to many of them. And they're not less intelligent than you are. They're just more, they're less experienced and you have to bring them into your world of how we talk about math. And it's the interface that's hard, not really the ideas, but you know, so that was always edifying to the student, or at least I hope it was edifying to the students. That was a very arrogant thing to say, my apologies. Um, <laughs> that se- appeared to be edifying to the students that they would feel relieved that now that they're becoming the graduate students and they're gonna be the teachers, that they didn't have this mantle on their shoulders, but they did have a responsibility to sort of to bring it forward. Yeah. But on a less serious note, nobody gets killed uh, in this example. Um, <laughs> and nobody feels, in- is I'm a, I'm a huge fan of like paranormal shows. Oh, nice. I don't believe in anything. I don't believe in ghosts. I mean, I believe ghosts happen as a phenomenon. I don't believe in the afterlife. I don't believe Bigfoot exists. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't believe it. But I love watching people convince themselves Yes. Um, of how that must have been a Bigfoot that we heard knocking. Right. You know, uh, that must have. I have a five dollar bet going with my daughter that they found Bigfoot in the show Finding Bigfoot. And that's why they canceled the show. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so. <laughs> But, you know, why do they believe that every sound is a Bigfoot? It's because it's a belief system they have. And that's a much safer one to walk in and out of. Um, you know, even the conspiracy theories are kind of fun to walk in and out of and kind of, um, you know, the whole Skinwalker Ranch thing. You're like, this is ridiculous. Um, it's clear that they're you know, de- deluding themselves on multiple fronts. 
But you walk in, you go, why are they doing that? That's an interesting place. It's much easier yes. to sort of to do that sort of liminal traveling uh, than it is to like, you know, play with people's lives in the fields of Afghanistan. <laughs> well, not play. I don't, you know, like <laughs> you're sort of affecting them. And, and I, I commend you for doing so. And I thank you for doing so. But man, that sounds scary to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love to watch the uh, the moon landing conspiracy stuff, especially like when they oh, cut yeah. to the NASA guy. They're like, how come we can't see stars? And the guy's just like, okay. <laughs> All right, listen. <laughs> the moon is very bright, right? We can see it. Yeah. It's like, and it goes into the next, but like every time the person is just like, I, my face is going to explode if I don't hold it together right, right now. <laughs> so funny. Oh, yeah. I, I listen to a lot of these podcasts. There's this great podcast called Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. And one of the things that they, they is a constant theme is you, they invite skeptics onto these shows to be, a bat, you know, a, basically a pinata. And they edit the hell out of them and like, you know, trying to, trying to tell you that even this scientist believes that it could be alien. Yeah, Come yeah. On. You know, it's, it, but it's such a, an effort to get there to believe that this is a ghost or this is a, this is something paranormal or this is a, you know, a skinwalker. This is, and the, the, you know what I, again, I know we're going over the racism in a lot of this, these beliefs is so amazing, especially when it comes to American Indians and trying to, cast american indians as these supernatural creatures rather than you know they have like it was a it was an indian burial ground and that's why it's hot that's like they're just people yeah they're people right they were yeah. good they were bad they were they had but they're people don't try to call them like some sort of child of the earth there's something more than they are they're people and you're being racist when you other them like that um so maybe maybe that should be my final if, thought if you want that. to ever <laughs> determine someone's level of understanding about what race is and all that kind of stuff just say are indians asians and then that's it. Yeah. It breaks their brain. And then if, if it doesn't break their brain, how about people from Yemen? How about people from Oman? Right. Are they Asians? No, of course not. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. Yeah. You know? Because the term has no implicit meaning, right? You know, like, <laughs> like from Timor least, you're closer to Australia than anywhere else in Asia. Are they Asians? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are, yeah. you know, but, but no, they're not. Oh, okay. Great. But All no, right. they're not. How could they be Pete? What are you talking about? Of course they are. <laughs> Sandra, you were allowed to ask one question this whole episode. That's it. You're not getting no, another one. That is just fine. That is just fine. I enjoyed the discussion thoroughly, as always. Um, and thank you for letting me be a fly on the wall. So, Thanks for putting um, the backpack on me and make me do all the work. Typical. Come on. No, Sandra's wonderful. I, I, I never get yeah. enough time with Sandra, and it's great. Let's do more of these. It's just always yeah. fun. You bring such interesting people on the show. And Brian, you're one of those people. So interesting, so fascinating. Oh I could talk to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been really enjoying this conversation, and I know that from like a, a, a certain level, it was really, as my wife would say, rangy. Yes. We went everywhere, but I really enjoyed it, Pete. So thank you so much for having me and letting me to sort of run my mouth on weird topics. If anybody wants to hear me run my mouth on weird topics, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> how, do, how do they find you? What's the best place? Ah, so verdant.ai, V-E-R-T-A-N-T.ai. I'm sure it'll go in show notes or something like that. Um, I'm, we're pretty easy to reach. Just reach out uh, to us there. Um, you know, we're all over social media. Um, we are implicitly curious people. So we talk about science. We talk about math. We talk about products, more primarily, because that's our business. But, you know, we talk about art. We talk about history. We talk about sociology. These are things that you'll find even within our blog. If you read through it, we never do a straight up, like, this is how a product works blog. It's always like, here's some cultural touch points. Here's mm -hmm. some other things you hopefully didn't consider when you were considering this particular aspect of how to build a database. Um, so we're just sort of um, interested people, uh, like hopefully it. interesting as well. <laughs> <laughs>